This is a Transfiguration Sunday. I think traditionally we were supposed to read Matthew 17, 1 to 8, or Mark 9, 2 to 8, or Luke 9, 28 to 36. But instead of reading those texts, which speaks about transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord led me to speak about Psalm 50. And on this special Sunday of Valentine's Sunday, we were supposed to talk about the love of God. We were supposed to discuss or to reflect on the love of God. But here we are speaking about a psalm which is kind of depicting a God who is not happy, a God who comes down to reprimand his own people on this Valentine's Sunday. You ask me what is wrong with this pastor today. But I think there is love in this psalm. I think the psalm 50 is about the love of God. And through the Spirit of God, we are going to reflect on that. So let us pray. God, we thank you this morning and ask for your Spirit to lead us as we reflect on your Word. The Word which is the light to our feet. The Word which shine in our lives so that we can see where you want us to go, and who you want us to be, God. So speak as we are ready to listen to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. A college campus used to have an annual religious emphasis week, prominently displayed over the door of their gymnasium where the session were being held was a huge banner that stated their theme, religion and life. Religion and life. After a few days, someone made an unauthorized change to the banner. Instead of religion and life, the person crossed out the words and substitute it within. So the banner now read as religion in life. And I think Psalm 50 is all about religion in life. So the scripture says the Lord summons its people. The people whose identity and life are determined by God's government. God's people. God didn't summon any other people but God's own people. The Lord God summoned his people not to bring damnation upon them. It says, I bring no charges against your worship practices. You remember before COVID, how our worship was. We will come by the door, the greeters will greet us and welcome us into the building. Then the ushers, while entering the sanctuary, will hand over the bulletin to us and say, this is the bulletin for this Sunday, this is the bulletin for this Sunday. They will hand over these bulletins. Then when... When we are about to start, the accolades will come and they will light the candles. And then the pastor will come and welcome us into our worship. And then the pastor will ask us to share the peace of the Lord. And they will be chaos in here while sharing that peace of the Lord. And then we will go into call to worship. We will call the Lord to be in this place as we worship. We will sing. And then... The church lady will come up here and she will deliver a great reflection 
on a family ministry. And then we will sing. The choir will sing a piece or the cross point will come and sing something nice for us. Then we will hear the scripture readings. And then the pastor will preach. And then we'll go into confession and then the assurance that God has forgiven us. And then we'll reach a time where it's time to give our offering and we'll worship God with our offerings. And the Lord says, oh, that is great. And the Lord was fine with that kind of worship. The Lord was fine. With us worshipping him that way. But somehow there was a problem with that worship. Somehow the Lord was not happy with something. The Lord was not happy with religion and life. In other words, the people of Israel did separate religion and life. Religion was the here and their life was there. And that way the problem was. The separation between religion and life was God main concern. And that can be seen in two different ways. The first one is the failure of the people of Israel to maintain their covenant. Their relationship with God. And the second one is the, their motivation of worshiping God with sacrificial offering. As people of the covenant, the children of Israel had their responsibilities on making sure that their relationship of, with God is nurtured. And one way, one of the ways to maintain that relationship with God was to offer sacrificial worship to God. And they were doing a great job in worshiping God with that way. But the problem arise when they fail to translate their worship experience into real life. They fall to move from religion and life to religion in life. After a great worship experience, instead of translating their experience into their daily living, they tend to admire and to support thieves. Adulterers became their friend of choice. They used their mouth for evil and honest their tongue to deceit. That's what was happening. And that's what was God's concern. That when they are in their sanctuary, they are in, in their temple, it was all about God. But when they go out of that place, it becomes something else. They become people who were not part of that covenant with God. And I think you will agree with me this morning that even us today, we struggle with how to translate our worship experiences into our daily life. Instead, we want to separate religion and life. That was not all. The other struggle was the motive of their worship. As a congregation, they came together to worship God. But their worship was only lip deep. They recite the creed, but do not take God's word seriously. The scripture says, you hate my instructions and cast my words be behind you. Their worship 
was not a transformative worship. What happened there they, is they were more concerned about keeping tradition of going to church and giving their sacrificial offering. And Walter Brueggemann referred to such worship as a transactional worship. A transactional worship, it when people come to give so that they can receive something in return. The people of the covenant were depending on the common theology of ancient Near East in which one does something for the gods and gets something in return. Perhaps they've come to think of God as simply another person in their community. Because what life is all about is to give so that you receive something in return. And they thought that that is who God was. But they were surprised. They were surprised to hear God telling them that that is not who I am. I am not like you. That is not the kind of relationship I am interested in. The most important thing about this text, it is when God comes down. When God comes down, something happens. When God's comes down it's not to proclaim doom on his people it is not to tell his people that you are beyond repair when god comes down it's for a good news god brings a good news when god comes down God comes down to remind his people of their responsibility, of their part of the, the covenant that they had to, res, to respect. I do appreciate the image that Reverend Kelly gave about the coming down of God in our last Thursday lecture divina. He says this, when God comes down, it's like a father after observing their child making mistakes and mistakes and mistakes. Then the father comes down to the level of the child, all the child's head, and tell the child that you need to listen. You need to listen, child. You need to listen, son. You need to listen, my daughter. And the son or the daughter might say, why should I listen? Then the father will respond and say, because I am your father, you need to listen. And that is what God is doing in this text. God's come down and tell the children of Israel, you need to listen because I am your God. When parents ask their children to listen, they don't speak in a way to degrade their children. They don't speak in a way to demoralize their children and tell them that you can't do anything in life. No. They motivate their children. They remind their children of the covenant. 
the, the relationship that they have with their children. It's a relationship of love. They remind their children that I want you to listen because I know what is happening. Because I love you and I want to help you. So when God comes down, is to remind us of that love. He did that in ancient time. And he did that when he sent his only begotten son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Not to condemn us, but to remind us of that covenant. To remind us of our part to play in that covenant. To remind us of our part to play in that relationship that we have with God. That is good news. When the God comes down, it's good news. It is not to terrorize us. But to show us love. To remind us of who God is and who we are. The other good news is found in that, in that relationship with God. We are not passive. We have a role to play. We have a role to play to maintain that relationship. And in order to sustain or to maintain that relationship, we are called to translate our worship experiences into actions. We are called to be people whose religion involves not only our lips, but also our legs. We are called to be the doers of the words. We are called not to join up with those who are stealing from the poor. We are called not to be supporters of immorality. We are called not to use our mouth for hate speech and lies. Our part of the covenant is to translate the worship experience into real life. That is religion in our lives. When our leaders come up with policies that are intended, as they say, to put poor people in their place. We stand up together and remind them we are all created to the image of God. And so there's no need to come up with policies of putting people in their places. But let us come up with policies that are going to reflect that we are all created to the image of God. We are all loved by the same God. When people, especially essential workers, are working hard but they are getting a salary which is not a salary that they can live with a full month. Our responsibility is as the children who, have, who are in a covenant relationship with God is to remind the legislature that this is not what you are supposed to treat people. People need to be treated fairly. So give people a reasonable minimum wages so that they can work and go home and be with their families. Not them working three, four, five jobs so that they can afford life. But pay them a fairly wage so that they, after work they can go home and be with their children. That is how we can translate our worship experiences into actions, into reality. It's not to support discrimination. It's not to support a, a slave wage. It's not to, 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 to support immorality. But it's to stand with God and say, no, this is not what the word of God says. That is what God wants. That is what God wanted from the people of Israel. And that is what God wants from us today. To keep God 
our lives in our hearts. To keep God alive in our hearts. That is what God is asking. In the novel, The Great Anger, a newcomer comes to a farm community. He refuses all friendship with his neighbors and put out the no trespassing sign. One day, a little girl from the town climbs underneath his fence to pet his dog. The vicious animal jumps on her and kills her. Hostility spreads throughout the community. When the newcomer comes to town, people don't want to talk to him. People don't want to do business with him. People are separating themselves with him. When springs comes and the merchant refuses to sell him seeds. But finally, the father of the girl who was killed comes over and sows his field. This act of kindness is too much for this newcomer. This newcomer didn't understand how the father of this girl could come and help him. So he asked, why? You of all people, why coming to help me? The father of that young girl responds, I do that to keep God alive in my heart. Instead of revenge, the man shows kindness to the newcomer. That is what it means to translate our worship experience in real life. As we normally pray, and I think we will pray the Lord's Prayer where we say, forgive us our trespasses. That man was not just praying that every Sunday in their worship service, but he translates that, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In forgiving the man whose dog had, 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 had killed his, his own daughter. That is how we translate our worship experiences from this building to the community. And that is what God is expecting from us. The future of this world depends on how we, who are in a covenantal relationship with God, works to maintain that covenant. My prayer is that this coming Ash Wednesday, we will not just fulfill another tradition, but we will move away from religion and life into religion in life this come Wednesday. My prayer is that as we start the 40 days of Lent, it won't just be another tradition, but we will move from religion and life into religion in life. That is what God is expecting from us. God has done his part. He has come down and remind us of the covenant. God has come down not to condemn us, but to remind us to invite us, to initiate the, the renewal of that covenant relationship with him. It is for us. It is for us to play our part in that covenantal relationship. And as we go through Ash Wednesday and uh, the 40 days of Lent, I pray that we will move from religion 
and life into religion in life. May God bless this word. Amen.